good morning, everyone. Uh, so we have a nice full room. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask if people could just come in towards the front, just the back end, just to come closer if possible, and move over to the other side. Just to, okay, guess not. <laughs> Um, thank you all for um, making the time to attend this session on the last day. Um, I know many people are traveling today, so maybe that's why our room is overpacked. Um, so first of all, this session is, in our opinion, one of the most important topics to actually focus on right now if you want to shape your digital future. Um, this session was organized by young African people who are very serious about shaping their digital future, and the internet shutdowns present a real threat to a prosperous and thriving digital future and digital economy in Africa. Um, last, actually a couple of weeks ago, we had the Africa IGF that took place in Egypt. And the theme for the Africa IGF was enabling an inclusive digital transformation for Africa. But we wonder if there is a persistent culture of internet shutdowns, how do we see an inclusive or even an, an enabling environment for digital transformation in Africa? Most of the sessions within the Africa IGF focused on promoting the digital Africa, promoting the internet economy, and also um, emphasizing that digital starts up, business uh, online is the way to go. Uh, lastly, the young people at the Africa IGF mentioned that ICTs and the internet play a big role in their advancements and development in their own lives. So internet shutdowns present a real threat to Africa's um, internet economy and futures. While preparing for this session, we actually did a, a short survey where we wanted to gather people's understanding of what internet shutdowns are and how they understand this in terms of the internet economy. We found really inter interesting insights, and the most important uh, topics that came out was that many people who participated in the survey felt that internet shutdowns have a direct um, impact on human rights and the economy. Many of the participants felt that internet shutdowns are a barrier to development and also um, further make Africa lag behind in terms of development. Um, some interesting verbatims actually that came from the, from the survey is that, you know, Africa missed out on the industrial revolution. We should not miss out on the digital revolution. So starting off the panel in this sense, we can already see that internet shutdowns are a real threat to Africa's development, but what do we do going forward? And I think that is why we have this rich panel to actually share some insights on what, what happens now? We know there's a problem, but how do we remedy this for a prosperous and thriving digital economy in Africa? So, uh, to open up the conversation is Joash Motoy from Kenya. He's an experienced researcher and policy analyst. Um, he's also a research associate at the Center for Human Rights and Policy Studies. Joash, over to you. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, internet shutdowns have become a mainstay in Africa. Um, as a result, there has been calls for a lasting solution for the vice. Uh, <clears throat> most discussions, however, have focused on the human rights approach, freedom of expression, with less uh, discussion on uh, the effect on the economy. Um, internet shutdowns actually are like avalanches that shut down on the foundation of the economy, leaving businesses um, going down. Uh, there's a famous quote, actually, that says, uh, shut down the internet and the economy goes with it. Um, therefore, there's need for us to focus on the economic beat, you know, touch on the economic consequences of these internet shutdowns. Um, speaking at a next Tech Africa conference in Nairobi, uh, the president uh, of Liquid Telecom, actually the CTO called Ben Roberts, told of a story of a government uh, that ordered an internet shutdown. Uh, two hours later, they realized that the, the, internet the internet shutdown had affected the economy and they called back because one company working f uh, drilling oil in the country had called back saying that they could not access their files because the internet had been shut down. So that's an example of how the internet actually affects the economy. Uh, in 2016 alone, uh, 11 countries have been faced with the internet shutdowns in Africa. Uh, leading to about uh, a loss of 237 million US dollars, according to research by uh, Brooklyn Institute. Um, if we do not act now, 
shutdowns and restriction of access will continue to rise and the economic cost will increase over the next few years at a time where the African countries can benefit the most from the internet access for their economic growth, education, and health. We cannot let this situation become the new normal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joash. Um, and you actually said something really interesting there. If we do not act now, we will suffer. Our next speaker actually comes from Cameroon, and Cameroon actually suffered the most or the longest internet shutdown recorded with 93 days. We've got Samuel Mbambo, who's a Cameroonian, Cameroonian oh, diplomat, serving as a MAG member for, I, for the IGF. Um, he's also currently the G20 scholar. So Samuel, what are your thoughts um, regarding internet shutdowns in Africa? Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Bambo Samuel. Uh, it is unthinkable in many parts of the world today that some people can go for a day without the internet. But the people of the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon went for three months without the internet. If these uh, people can survive it, so many of us here can. But the question is at what cost? The financial impact of uh, internet shutdown is enormous. The impact is on the side of the government. It is also on the side of the business stakeholders and individuals suffer also. But not all losses can be explained in monetary terms. How do we equate the loss of opportunities to monetary losses? Students in the English region of Cameroon, that is the Northwest and Southwest regions, which experienced the internet shutdown, had been doing online studies. And because of these internet shutdowns, they had to suspend most of their programs, and some actually gave up finally. Prospective students actually had to register for online uh, exams. And because of these internet shutdowns, these opportunities were lost. Businessmen lost opportunities of meeting potential clients. Social media is that factor that keeps the bond of the family in English Cameroon together. Without the Skype and the Facebook and other medium, families were disrupted. Youth in the young startup environment of Boya, which we today look, at, look up to as our own Silicon Valley in Cameroon, were faced with this dilemma of not being able to come up with ideas or finalizing ideas that they had started up. This is an opportunity lost. The internet shutdowns in Cameroon brought a new wave of migration. And I will title these migrants the internet hunters. I, for one, I had this particular experience. I was nominated to the MAC in uh, January. And uh, I was living then in Bamenda, which was within the zone that experienced the internet shutdown. For me to be able to communicate, I had to gather my material, and I had to travel to the internet zone okay. to communicate with the IGF secretariat. I would travel once every week at times. I would travel once in two weeks. My case is not an isolated one. We have businessmen. We have journalists who need to correspond on a daily basis. And they were bound to travel every day to go to an internet port or a cyber cafe on the other side of the internet uh, divide just to be able to communicate with your correspondents out of Cameroon. The internet shutdown also created a new movement in Cameroon. This movement was, is, has as its foundation a group of radicalized internet users who think that these shutdowns are really hampering their livelihoods. That is why today, online, you will have the hashtag, bring back our internet. 
This movement has made many Cameroonians actually change the course of their lives because some of the Cameroonian youths today, like me, are dedicated to fighting this ill. It is rather unfortunate that this ill, however, continues. We should note that Cameroonians cannot combat this thing alone. And facing the government of Cameroon is like facing a Herculean, it's like facing a, a, a gargantuan opponent. So they need the international community to support them. However, we appreciate so much the fact that uh, the international community spoke loud and clear and internet was restored. But that didn't last long because as we all know, the interruptions continue. Financial losses were enormous, as I earlier said, but the loss of opportunities are what many Cameroonians cannot still come to terms with today. I will throw back the question to the floor. Why do governments shut down the internet when they actually know that they sh the shutdowns do not give any positive impact on the security of the nation? That is a question that we need to ponder again. And thank you very much, Chair, for giving me the floor. Thank you so much, Samuel, for shedding light on that. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's very clear that, as you mentioned correctly, that it's not only the economic implications that make internet shutdowns an important issue to actually focus on. Uh, there are social, there are human rights issues also related to internet shutdowns. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. I want to give the floor now to Mr. Wakabi, or Dr. Wakabi, uh, from CIPESA. Uh, CIPESA recently conducted a report that actually calculates the cost of internet shutdowns to Africa's internet economy. Um, Dr. Wakabi is executive director of CIPESA and has been involved in the ICT and internet policy landscape in Africa for many years. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, yes, um, I think as the first speaker mentioned, there has been quite a lot of uh, effort put towards uh, talking about the effects of shutdowns on uh, human rights, on free expression, on the right to access information, on the right to assembly, but there has been very little effort that has been put to uh, establishing what the economic impact of shutdowns is on uh, uh, our countries. It is, of course, important for us to understand what the cost of the shutdowns is to try and use this as a case with governments to dissuade them from uh, effecting shutdowns, to use it as a case with the internet service providers and telecom companies to make them also come to the side of citizens and speak out against shutdowns. Similarly, we need more citizens to, to see what the impact of the shutdowns is in order for them to be involved actively in speaking out against shutdowns. In sub-Saharan Africa, we have had uh, very many countries have uh, order shutdowns. Uh, we've had at least uh, 12 of them in the last two years or so. Some of them have had uh, repeat disruptions, not just once, countries such as uh, Uganda or Cameroon, Ethiopia, they've shut it down more than once. Um, so we came up with the, this method for calculating the economic cost of shutdowns that goes beyond what uh, existed in the past, namely the ones by Deloitte and by Brookings. These were chart-breaking uh, frameworks, but they only measured the, the impact of uh, a shutdown uh, based on the country's GDP. So what we did, and they also they did not specifically develop the framework for the African context, sub-Saharan context. So we started the ICT framework within the region. We started the digital economy and the entire IT ecosystem and then came up with this framework, which besides looking at the GDP, also looks at the impact of a shutdown on uh, um, for instance, the country's risk profile on lost GDP, 
sorry, on lost uh, foreign direct investment, on the lowering of uh, uh, investor confidence, the higher cost of money. And also what we found that uh, one of the key conclusions, of course, is that even when a country orders a shutdown for five days, the effects of that shutdown are going to last beyond those five days because shutdowns have a systemic effect on the efficiency within a country. They disrupt supply lines, they disrupt uh, efficiencies within not just the immediate ICT ecosystem, but within the entire economy. Because as we know, ICT has become so diverse in every aspect of the African society. Mobile money is so, so, so widespread in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, up to half of the GDP of the country's money and uh, production go through mobile money services. There is 78 telephone connections for every 100 individuals in Africa. We have the uh, 22% of the population of the continent using the internet. So ICT is key, key to the efficiency and functioning of our economies. It is key to deliver of services like agriculture, like uh, health services. So without it, the effects will be there immediate, but also longer term. Thank you, Dr. Wakabe. Um, you've actually raised a really good point there around that um, internet shutdowns actually affect the whole ecosystem. It's not just limited to what we may think that, that, that the internet is only, it ends there, therefore there are no wider social impacts. Now I'd like to call on Aisha Jaredi, who's the North African coordinator of ACES. She will take us through uh, some of the ways that internet shutdowns actually impact us achieving SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanda. I'm very uh, glad to be among the, the, yeah. So actually my contribution will be based on four main points. I'll be providing a general overview of the internet shutdown in North Africa or in North African region. And then I'll be speaking about the effects of the internet shutdown taking two slots, uh, the effects on digital economy and the effects on SDGs. I'll be talking thirdly about the future of internet economy of internet economy with internet shutdowns in North African context, and then and we'll end up with uh, three recommendations. So the situation in North Africa is not different from the rest of the of the continent. So we had experienced internet shutdowns, but not with the frequency for with the frequency of other um, other part of uh, Africa. The reasons also do not vary much. So we experienced internet shutdowns after and during the Arab Spring and the Arab Revolution took or erupted in Egypt and Tunisia. It had all, we had also internet shutdowns in Algeria uh, because uh, prior bef uh, before the, uh, the exam, the, um, the exam to, uh, to impede cheating, and Morocco, we had, uh, they had uh, not internet shutdowns, but it were um, actually a blocking of VOT. So let's start about with Tunisia. So Tunisia had the internet shutdown during the Arab Spring in the hopes that it would stop protests and political dissidents. And these shutdowns targeted mainly Facebook and social media, which helped uh, the protest and, and helped the regime to, uh, to get rid of the regime, actually. It was the same case in Egypt. I will not elaborate more uh, because my friend is going to uh, talk about it. So uh, the uh, shutdown caused 90% drop of internet traffic in Egypt. It was uh, at the same period of the Tunisian uh, internet shutdown. Then in Sudan, the internet uh, shutdown, the internet services were abruptly shut down while protests swelled in the capital Khartoum. And it was because of the, um, the rise or the doubling of the price of the gas and uh, the rise of protests because of these reasons. So the shutdown, erupted, uh, the shutdown took place in Sudan on uh, September 25th in 2013. Moving to Algeria, Algeria has become the latest country in the Middle East and North African region to block Facebook and Twitter in a bid to stop students from cheating on exams. So uh, according to Algerian officials, prior to the students' baccalaureate exams, test questions were leaked. 
to social media, prompting officials to ban the social network to prevent further cheating. More than 550,000 Algerian students will have to retake the exams again. Ending up with Morocco, as I told you earlier, internet freedom declined. There were not much shut down, but we are more precisely talking about blocking uh, VOIP. So internet freedom, um, so it happened. Morocco's regulator blocked uh, free voice calling features provided by apps like WhatsApp, Skype, or Viber under the pressure of telecommunication providers. Restrictions on VoIP impact on countries' entrepreneurs who depend on VoIP when interacting with clients. People also were prevented from uh, doing um, free calls. Moving to the second slide of my presentation, I'll be talking about the effects of internet shutdowns. I um, took, I'll be uh, based on uh, the uh, last report by CIPESA. So the total cost, the total uh, economic cost of internet shutdown is calculated in terms of internet GDP loss estimate plus the national estimate loss digitalization cost saving and efficiency, efficiency gains plus the country risks. So according to this rule, the economic cost of internet shutdowns in Morocco um, were about $320.5 million for 182 days. It costed Algeria $20.5 million for, si sorry, for six days. And it costed more than $90 million for Egypt. I also um, took the Cameroon and uh, probably some will talk about that. Now we move into the effects of the shutdown on SDGs. Actually, the uh, internet shutdown affect more than one SDG goal, but most of them is SDG number 17, which has to do with technology, namely ICT, to reach, which is supposed to reach all uh, the countries. There also uh, SDG goal number nine, which says that universal access to the internet by 2020 to bring everyone online. It's also affected SDG three because shutdown impedes access to emergency medicines and health services. We're talking also about SDG number 16 because that states that governments must open access to all sorts of data as a matter of accountability and best, and best practice governance. Moving to the third part, the future of internet economy with internet shutdown. I'll be short. <laughs> okay, so um, I tried to gather um, the most important effect on, in uh, North Africa. So internet shutdown violate, violate human rights create trade by barriers, impede the media, conflicts with UN SDGs, next please, cause GDP loss and loss of economic uh, disasters, harm tourism, risk foreign uh, direct investment. Now I'll end up with the recommendation. I based my recommendation, next please, on three main points. So the first one is um, to adopt or to to adopt the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms. The second, to engage in campaigns like Keep It In Campaign of, uh, Keep It In Campaign, and uh, also to projects like Project Shutdown Tracker Optimization by Access Now. So it was, that was, I was, uh, I hope I was too short. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Aisha, for that um, very in-depth analysis of internet shutdowns um, in North Africa. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things that I've noticed with <coughs> internet shutdowns is actually they normally happen when there's political unrest or maybe when governments are being questions, questioned. Therefore, governments sometimes feel, why don't we just switch these people off through switching off the internet? So with that, I'd like to call on Mohammed, who's an Egyptian human rights lawyer who I hope will shed some light on the legality and um, how internet shutdowns actually contravene um, human rights and international standards. Please, thanks, Yolanda. Uh, my intervention will be focused, as Yolanda mentioned, about the legal uh, framework of shutdowns. 
So let me start to speak about the international legal framework. Uh, and I will not uh, elaborate more in this, because I, I know that more, uh, most of you are aware about the international uh, legal framework. So digital rights and uh, freedom of expression, freedom uh, uh, right to association, uh, it's all is recognized in international uh, human rights laws, especially as we speak about the uh, human rights uh, declaration and the International Convention uh, for Political and Civil uh, Rights and International Convention uh, for uh, uh, Economic and Civil, Social and Civil uh, rights. Civil rights. Uh, the most important thing, and we'll not discuss the articles included in this conventions, but the most important question about the international legal framework. If this legal framework is still relevant in the era of uh, technology, uh, communication technologies or not, uh, and also uh, let me say that the internet shutdowns has become uh, very critical issues after 2011, uh, after the Egyptian evaluation. Uh, revolutions, because what the Mubarak regime did in the Egypt by the shutdowns, the mobile service, and internet, it's, it's make the sh internet shutdown uh, pros the attention in national, uh, national and international level. Uh, after the, the 2011 revolutions, uh, the special reporters for UN about uh, freedom of expression, and to from uh, African uh, Commission on Human, uh, human Rights, uh, Human and People Rights, they stated our issued some declaration about this, and they stated that cutting off uh, access to the internet uh, or part of the internet for whole population or segment of public can never be justified, including a public order or national security. So we have concluded that the national security or public order is not be justification to shut down the internet. Why is it for this? Because most of countries, most of governments, whether in Africa or out of Africa, is using the reason or uh, the argument of national security as, as a reason to shut down the internet. And also the measures, <coughs> also the internet, uh, the internet shutdowning measures that cannot be justified un under human rights uh, law. Now let me uh, to move to national level. So uh, we will speak about or we use Egypt experience uh, as as a case study for the reasons that I mentioned. Since 2011, and what happened, and the regime, Mubarak regime, he attempted to re retain the power by shut down the internet. Uh, and fortunately, this action is, was ineffective because this action brought more people into streets and asking for change the regimes. Uh, the situation in Egypt, and also after that, if we speak about now in 2017, from May 2017, the, the current regime, he all started to use the shutdown, internet shutdowns. So we speak about from May to July 2017, around 300 websites are plugged, were plugged. And by the end of October, this number reached it to 400 websites plugged. The problem is the government doesn't uh, mention or declare about the reason behind the blog this website. They refrain to disclose the reason behind uh, blocking this website. Okay. Okay. Uh, in Egypt, the government is lay on three different laws to take this action, to legal, legalize the uh, internet shutdown. This one in about the emergence law, 
and uh, emergency law and anti-terrorism laws. Uh, let me, and although the Const Egyptian constitution is ensure that the old peoples have a right to access to information, and the state and the country, Egyptian country have, and government have ensured that they reach or access to internet and not be prevented from access to information. So in the, in the end, let me to conclude uh, the situation if in Egypt and uh, in, in the region that the internet shut down become becoming a new control tools and preferred mechanism using to suppress the freedom of expression and digital rights in the world. Internet shut down are affected through orders to internet service providers, ISPs, because in Egypt, the, under the Egyptian law, the government in some specific cases like national security has a right to subject the management of service provider under the Egyptian government. Through this, the Egyptian government could issue clear decision to service provider to cut the internet. And this, would ha well, this was happened in 2011, and also this was happened days during 2017. Also, the government using the legislation tools to legalize, to legalize uh, abuse of uh, the digital rights and consequences legalize the internet shutdown. The recommendations, I'll be so is the recommendation. Uh, the first recommendation to IG stakeholders, this is a time to, to all stakeholders to, to work to adopt uh, binding legal documents, legal documents legally uh, to, to guarantee the protect uh, internet or digital rights and also perhaps it shut down actions. And the government should respect the human rights online and also take the measures I will ensure all the measures and policies or legislation comply with constitution and international uh, human rights law. Also the government should, should make the public the decision of uh, internet shutdown to allow to the people and the users to challenge this decision and be reviewed by from before uh, uh, independent judicial, uh, judicial bodies. Civil society also strongly should advocate uh, for internet uh, freedoms, whether in law and in practice, and also through the coalitions and advocacy uh, campaigns. And also, it's very important, important to directly engage in the policy dialogue with the governments. Uh, the last thing, this message for the government, this message, this message is uh, the governments or the internet shutdowns is absolutely not the tool to retain the powers. But it's desperate attempt to suppress the, the digital rights. In democracy and the rule of law, the only tools to retain the powers and acquire the political legitimacy. And the political regime have to consider that the digital rights and digital democracy is one of factors has strong impact in in the, the, the regime's legitimacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, I would like for the panelists to please stick to time because mm -hmm. the main point of this actually conversation is to create dialogue um, and to find possible solutions to internet shutdowns. Um, and this actually brings me to my favorite speaker. <laughs> The most provocative person that I know, um, Ms. Fiona Asonga from um, Kenya. Uh, she uh, is the CEO of the Kenya Internet Exchange Point, and she actually came up, or at least she was part of the group that recommended a policy to actually alleviate internet shutdowns um, in Africa. So we've been talking about the problem, we know what the problem is, but how do we remedy this? And I know it's not an easy one to remedy or at least solve for, but I'd like to hear what you have to say, Fiona. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when we talk about internet shutdowns, I think we need to ask ourselves what uh, uh, my colleague had mentioned. Why do governments orchestrate the shutdowns? 
And uh, I'm not going to talk about the policy proposal we wrote because that proposal was written with an objective to generate conversation and to get the technical community to engage governments more. Reason being, we've had a technical community that has been very vibrant and very strong on the African continent. But I think some of us in the technical community got to a point where we felt we should be the experts. And therefore, we should not be able to share that knowledge with others. And the reason I say that is that if you've been in the, in the, in the internet ecosystem and been involved in uh, the regional fora for the last three years, and you've never gotten your government representatives into any of those meetings, there is where we are going wrong. The governments that shut down the internet, that ask for shutting down of the internet, do so because of lack of capacity and a lack of knowledge and a lack of engagement with their communities. And so when we wrote the proposal, we wrote it because we felt that we needed to reach out to other governments. It was a group of Kenyans, and we did it knowing very well that in Kenya we have a government that listens, we have a constitution that requires the government to listen to all stakeholders. We engage our government on a daily consistent basis, and if the government doesn't listen, we can go to constitutional court and block whatever decisions they make. But that is a privilege for Kenyans. How do we get that kind of engagement facilitated in other African countries? So we wrote a proposal, and the first part of that proposal said, this is draconian. This is a very draconian proposal. And that meant that we knew what we were writing was appropriate because in the, in the standards of what a good proposal is within the region, it should not target one stakeholder. It should be balanced. It should be equal. There's equality amongst all stakeholders. But this proposal was very specific, targeting governments. So from a technical point of view, from a technical point of view, that proposal was a non-starter, but it was a document to generate conversation. A lot of civil society entities picked it up, but let me just let the civil society entities in the room know that that proposal, will, a proposal like that within any of the regions will never go anywhere because it's not balanced, because it's targeting a specific stakeholder, but it was a good document to generate a conversation, and the conversation is still going on, and we hope as the conversation goes on, as the technical community, we can begin to engage our governments more. So I'm not going to talk about that proposal, but I'm going to ask you in this room, if you have been involved in, in this kind of fora, in the ICANs, in the AFRINIC meetings, and you have never, you do not even know who in your regulatory agency is responsible for the internet or IP address numbering, you do not know who in your ministries handles internet issues or IP numbering issues or domain issues, you are failing us. And that is why we are having shutdowns. So how do we move forward? Thank you. Wow, strong words from Fiona there. Um, yes, I would also clap for that. Um, so just touching on that, I'd like to call on my next speaker actually, who I hope will give us a much more, I guess, broader view on internet shutdowns and possibly recommend ways to help us because in his region, he doesn't know about internet shutdowns. He hears it from us. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to call on Niall Harper, who is the founder and managing director of Octave Consulting Group and also the senior manager for Next Gen Leaders um, at Internet Society. Niall, please allow us. Good, good day, folks. So essentially is this, um, in my region, I'm from the Caribbean region, so we don't see internet sh shutdowns. The, the worst thing we've experienced thus far is we really we're seeing a number of internet service providers, they engage in content, uh, uh, content res uh, restrictions, and it's more around network new, new neutrality violations. They're trying to, to f kind of force over the top providers to contribute to investments in their networks. But I think based on that as well, I think we've touched on the human rights implications, we've, t we've touched on the economic implications, but there are also some network implications as well in terms of we're seeing that internet shutdowns are impacting network architecture and network read the 
redundancy in terms of mm -hmm. routing paths. It's actually preventing redundant uh, routing paths. It's actually Im impacting the, the ability of networks to self to um, heal. Um, we're also seeing more and more into two in the African region, which is very important as you use um, the building out of the data centers and more software as a service offerings and infrastructure as a service offerings that are being used by international companies who are investing in the region. It's impacting the, avail the, avail the availability of those services as well. Um, Additionally, another very concerning um, development that we've seen as well in terms of smart uh, algorithms that, that are driven by machine uh, um, by machine machine learning, you're seeing that impacting in terms of very real-time censorship of inf of information, censorship of freedom of expression, and it's a lot um, harder to detect, and it's a lot more as more impossible around preventing it. And I think as you move forward, I think you need to look at ISPs and network operators as a very important aspects of fighting internet shutdowns. As, as uh, Fiona said, there's the ability for them to actually go to court and say to the, the government, look, this is very wrong, and did they have the to have the support of constitutional uh, uh, law as well as human rights law. We're also seeing what's also more important as well is really, I put forward this recommendation as a solution. We're seeing a lot of international funding and development, uh, development agencies invested in the region. I think they can put as a condition in some of their agreements that if a government shuts down the, the, the internet, they, they will rescind those uh, funds. And I know it's, it will affect the development, but you should think of it from, a, from the perspective of governments need these uh, funds to, to, to really uh, drive um, uh, human, social, and economic development. So these funds are very much needed. And if, if there's the uh, threat of these funds being rescinded, governments might think, think uh, think uh, uh, twice. Um, thank you so much, Niall, for um, contributing to the panel from a, I guess, Global South perspective. Um, so I'd like to open up to the floor now for any questions or uh, interventions from the floor, if there are any. Okay, so can I see two hands? Uh, Sarah? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sarah Kiden. <coughs> Sorry, I'm an ISO GF ambassador, uh, 2017, and I just wanted to ask uh, something. So we are saying that uh, uh, we're talking about governments and saying we're not engaging them, but I noticed that the panel doesn't have any person from the government. Are we not talking to each other? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ufa. I'm an ISOC Youth at IGF Fellow from Nigeria. Okay, um, we're all aware of the um, issues relating to internet shutdown. We're aware of the economic toll it takes on Africa's economy. We are aware of the legality structure of everything. But we should also know that the internet right now is one of the great, it's not one of, it's the greatest communication tool that is. We know the Internet is the greatest invent, one of the greatest inventions. We know the power of the internet. And we also know that the internet, the power of the internet can be harnessed by, um, let me say, bad people per se. And we also know that these people can use the internet for bad in such a way that they can promote violence, they can promote hate speech, they can promote riots, they can promote political instability in all capacities. And we can, and the government right now, 10 years ago, they were used to handling these kind of situations in a different way. They have not seen where something can start in one state and then in three seconds, rally is happening in another geog geographical region. They have not seen where social media can rally youths from all parts of the globe in about two hours. They have not seen this kind of situations. So um, I'd just like to throw it out there that what would you rather that the governments do in cases where the internet is 
being harnessed to promote political instability. Thank you. Are there any other questions or must I? Okay. So, wait, oh yes. Thank you, my name, <coughs> sorry, my name is Walter Nates, I'm from the Netherlands, and I've been invited to come to the session by the gentleman over there. And I was wondering what I could contribute from coming from a completely different part of the world. But I think there's two things that I would like to say. The first is that the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity, which I participated in, has recognized this as a potential topic for 2018. So if you think this is of importance, also from a cybersecurity point of view, please engage with that forum so that it will be on the roster for 2018, so that is one. The other one is I would like to make an analogy with my own country, and we're going back 450 years. I'm a historian by, uh, by education, but what actually happened is this. We were ruled by the King of Spain, and he was seen as his benevolent, all-good leader until he proved himself not to be, and then a resistance started in 1568. And somehow, in that transition in the Netherlands, the press, the, the press machines the, for books were liberalized. There was no longer restrictions. So all over, from all over Europe, people came to the Netherlands to, play, to, to produce their things on science, on po politics, on etc. And from the Netherlands, they were illegally distributed to other countries. And now we have the internet, which is a tool, but for in the eye of some people, I think it's a weapon. It's a weapon for good, it's a weapon for bad, but it's also a weapon for information, which helps people be less ignorant over time because they access information that they never has, have seen before. And if there are hubs in, in Africa, then you could consider whether you could take that role of the Netherlands into the 21st century and perhaps use it again for education, for information, so that people actually can make up their minds in different ways. And then what you say by engaging through with the right people through the right venues then things will slowly change and it took us 350 years to have a complete uh, and free society because that's only something which is of the last hundred years and my story started in 5068 so so in other words it takes time but you've got a tool that has so much more speed that you can probably do it much much faster than the society i come from was ever able to do. And that's a word of hope, but it's also something that you need to grasp. So I wish you all the luck with that, but I think that this is, this is at least an example that shows that there, there is hope. So I hope that helps a little. Is there another hand? Oh, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Olu. Um, I'm new to internet governance, this is my first IGF. Uh, but I'm a technology consultant for, I've been there for, year, uh, for years. So I see some of the conversations going around how the government, what the government should be responsible for, what operators should be responsible for. So my question and comment is in twofold. First of all, I think we need to hold the government accountable and operators accountable. How do we do that? We should try something different, which is not an aggressive approach to always go on the streets. So. Um, Civil society and um, possibly the um, big uh, companies should invest in engaging government on a non-aggressive approach, which is to educate them that this is the reason why you shouldn't shut down the internet. These are the this is the good that the internet provides. That's one. The other thing that they should we should do is also hold um, operators accountable with the global view. So, for example, operators are part of a global um, global organization. So. The telcos um, submit to like a bigger IT or something like that. Um, th they don't. Operators are accountable to their national residential. Okay, first. Okay, so that, that shows you that I'm, I'm new to the terrain. But um, like um, Nigel said, some of them get funding, some the government gets funding and support from organizations, from um, global organizations. Those guys can put pressure on them. The UN and uh, all the, the UIT, you can put pressure on government to, 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 to um, see the implication that if you go this, down this path, there will be implications for your actions. So I think the two things we can do is engage government, I know many of them are not here, um, but engage government in a non-aggressive um, way to educate them and also then hold them accountable in the global um, framework. 
Thank you. Um, thank you to all the, the questions. I think the most, maybe the, the first one that we could respond to is, we're talking to ourselves, where is government? Um, panelists, does anyone want to take a stab to respond to the questions? Okay, the old ladies. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I don't because I wasn't involved in organizing the panel, but I think it would have been good. We had asked that government be present and they were not able to confirm, but out of curiosity, how many in the room are government representatives? How many? Show of hands. <laughs> No, we don't want to, no, 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 no. We don't want to kill you for it, just to know, just to know the level, gauge the level of interest in the subject from governments. <laughs> yes, and so that clearly shows you, it actually clearly demonstrates how concerned governments are about the issue of internet shutdowns. And that is why I was saying many of them it's because of a lack of capacity. Secondly, how many here run networks? Communication infrastructure, a network of any sort. Again, we don't have enough of those in this room because those are the guys who are told by governments, shut down the internet. Otherwise, we withdraw your license. If your license is taken, you'll never operate again. So you adhere to the shutdown, hoping it will be a few hours, a few minutes, not more than a day, and you can be able to get back on and continue with your business. How many in here civil society? No. <laughs> Still, civil society is not doing enough to help us create that awareness to the governments because for those who run networks, it's technically possible to address some of the problems that the governments want to address with the technical community. Are we not able to using uh, the, the numbering system, the domain and numbering system, identify who is where and track them down and deal with them as individuals? We are. But do our governments know that when there is a problem, they go to the village and they arrest the whole village because there is one thief in the village. So everybody goes to jail. So we need to be able to create, you have basically repeated what, the last comment was repeating what I had actually said. We need to be able to build capacity within our government institutions. Okay, for all of us who are here, who knows who's responsible for the internet in your country, either at the regulator <laughs> or at the ministry, as in the specific individuals whose title is uh, internet something officer or director or something, who knows? Because I do. <laughs> and I spend time with them, letting them understand how this internet works, how things can work, and we've gotten to a point where we work together. When I feel there is something fishy, I'll even go and tell them before they tell me, I tell them, hey, we have seen something on the net and we need you to send police officers to this location to find out what is happening. So one time we even found a, a group of 30 Chinese in a room, in a house in Kenya, who are running proxy servers from Kenya. And they were all arrested and they were deported. That is how the technical community, how precisely the technical community can work with governments. But do we spend time letting our governments know that this can happen? Okay, we have a government official who wants to <laughs> conversation. <laughs> uh, I'm not from government per se, but I'm a regulator. One of the things which uh, I think I agree with Fiona is the issue of education. And sometimes, as a regulators, we want you, the civic society, to play your role and you are not there. For example, the government will be put here legislation because these things, when they are being implemented, whether it's shut down, you'll find that there is a law somewhere which begs that. And the best way to attack is to make sure that when that law is being made, we actually ad address that law that this law will not work for A, B, C, D. And we work as civil society and we comment. But most of the time is, you know, we pass documents and documents for consultation 
and we do not receive any comments. Sometimes I even tell our, you know, this, that even if you are a small civic society in our country, just take the document, share it with your colleagues internationally to say, you know what, in Botswana we have this law which is about to pass. Can you assist me with comments? Because that will enrich the, underst <coughs> the understanding. So that is actually one of the challenges which I have actually realized that, you know, we can come and talk here, but if we do not address the problem at home, it will not solve the problem. It's for us to go there, sit down with those people. We are always available. Most of the regulators, I can tell you, are because I interact with most of our colleagues in the region, is the consultation process they have. They have an open door, but it's most of the time is we do not get inputs from the, the, the community we work. Yes, the service provider, we have a, a rule which we can use because we give them license, we can always tell them do this and do this. But those whom we do not license, which are the consumers, when we put a document across to say, can you comment, we do not get any comments. We'll only get the comments from what? The service providers, because them, they are looking at their own interests. So sometimes I, I do urge you, in terms of capacity building, assist your civic societies also in, the, in our area so that they can also actively participate. Um, so in terms of capacity I'm building, so at the, the, the um, Internet Society, we've been, do, we have quite a few programs where we've done a lot of outreach and engagement with the governments in terms of meeting with, meeting at the ITU, meeting with the African uh, Union, meeting at the OECD to really engage the government representatives to, to discuss internet shutdowns, the, the um, human rights and economic implications. But besides that too, we, we've also de developed a number of youth programs and you would have heard from Sarah said she's an IGF ambassador and the other young lady, she, she's a youth IGF fellow. What we've been uh, doing as well is getting a lot of young people who, who have very uh, um, high potential engage in internet governance discussions, developing their capacity so they can then go back to their regions and go back to their countries and engage their governments as well as their concentric circles to, to build a awareness about some of these um, uh, um, issues. And finally, something we've also done with the internet engineering t task force. We actually have a program where we bring regulators and, and other government representatives to the internet engineering task force, which is a very, very in-depth engineering um, environment and bring them there to better understand how n networks are built and how, how interfering with networks, whether it be filtering, whether it be shutdowns, how that impacts the, re the recoverability, the availability, and the integrity of these, of these systems. Thank you, Alana. I'd relate to uh, what uh, just uh, Neil said about capacity building. I'd, uh, I'd stress the importance of youth in this process because, and I think as uh, talking about North, uh, North Africa or South Africa or all parts of Africa, we have the skilled people and we have the capacity to, uh, to learn more about internet governance and um, internet processes. But I think the problem comes from um, the government themselves. Maybe, um, maybe some governments are reluctant to open the floor and to cooperate with the civil society organizations. They are still um, not trusting these organizations to have a role in, 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 um, in solving maybe problems in their societies. So uh, I think this is the main, or the major, um, like the major um, step back of um, the lack of participation of governments in, the, in this uh, panel and, and, and this uh, workshop. Thank you. Thanks. Um, two things. I think the gentleman from uh, Botswana, I guess you're from Bokra, yeah, spoke um, something which is actually, we have seen in a number of, a number of countries. Increasingly, 
many governments, many regulators are open to receiving submissions on uh, proposed laws and regulations from uh, private sector and civil society. But we, we did a study last year, I think on 14 countries in Eastern Southern Africa. We, we found that although those mechanisms are increasingly available, there are actually very little submissions from uh, members of civil society. But also we found that uh, the uptake of the uh, contributions from civil society remain low. So that, that plus the, the, the fact of capacity are some of the reasons why we see little uh, inputs to, to when, when there, there are calls. So I think there is indeed a need for one, generate evidence, do analysis in order to inform the submissions that are going to be made to, to government bodies. But uh, something else which I want to talk to is uh, the intermediaries. I think at the moment, although intermediaries have their licensing obligations, they can still do more in support of the rights and the aspirations of their subscribers. We know that they have uh, licenses under which a regulator has the power to order them to switch off um, services, granted. But there are some subtle things which they could do that can help the cause for those who are fighting for the internet to, to remain free and open. For instance, they could issue more transparency reports showing us exactly what governments are ordering them to do, what, how much citizen data they are asking them to provide, and how they are complying with these kind of requests. MTN, which operates in 18 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, does not release this information. The Europe-based um, bodies such as Orange and Millicom and Vodafone, they issue this information, although in some countries like Kenya and Tanzania, the laws bar them from releasing uh, some of the data, particularly in Kenya, Vodafone can't do that, whereas they can do that in Tanzania and very many other countries. That data is useful for us as civil society, as academicians, to know what a government uh, asking for, how can we use that data in order to make our case? Secondly, there is the case of the countries that where the, there have been shutdowns. Why doesn't the telecom operators issue information to show how much money they, they, they made during that quarter when there was a shutdown as opposed to a quarter when there was no shutdown without them actually saying anything else about it and then civil society will be able to take that uh, data and make sense out of it and use it as evidence to make the case against shutdowns. But there's also the issue that has come up here of being present in meetings such as this. They will not have to speak like us and say internet shutdowns are never a necessary and proportionate measure to respond to uh, protests or elections or exams. But they'll be able to give some perspective of what we are doing that will help us to actually advance the cause against shutdowns. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh, many have talked about the multi-stakeholder approach, but uh, at the national level, um, the power of the state um, to disrupt the internet uh, lies with the state um, most often. So this blows the whole approach of the multi-stakeholder model. So in my opinion, I believe that uh, we need uh, a push by civil society and the technical community uh, uh, to force mostly African governments to integrate uh, um, digital tools into their systems. Uh, in this way, uh, it will be very, very difficult and may act as a deterrent for them to uh, um, disrupt entire networks mostly. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so in terms of accountability of uh, countries or ISPs, uh, the situation in Egypt is very, is very weird because it's not limited to issued licenses or the, you can withdraw the license from the operators. Because the philosophy of the Egyptian law is different because 
under the Egyptian law, as I mentioned uh, during my intervention, that the Egyptian government has a right to issue orders to ICBs to shut down the internet. This is, this is not strange, but what is strange is the ICBs is exempted from, from any uh, responsibility or uh, accountability. So the nationals or the user cannot uh, file a suit before the courts against the operators for the shutdown of the internet. More than that, according to the Egyptian law, the government uh, or the operators, ICBs, uh, have a right of remedy in the period of shutdown. So that means uh, the national law is not assist uh, or working in the issue or the uh, question of accountability, accountability or, or responsibility of the operators. So I see that we have to go forward or adopting any other legal documents, be more working and effective and force the governments to respect the human rights, digital human rights uh, for the users. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. Are there, are there any other follow-up questions? Um, yes, Michael. Yeah, basically everyone else has spoken, but none of us has looked at the shutdown in the, from the security point of view. It's, it's not the intention of government to shut down the internet, like just literally like that. There should be some underlying reasons. Some of the reasons, like I'm speaking from the security background, some of them like are for security. In, they put the security of the country at, in interest first. We know when you shut down the internet, it's like you close the door where everything stops going in and out. Meaning that the banking sector, uh, the small businesses, and everything is affected. Of course, you can't defragment the internet and actually distribute it like separately and say, okay, the banking service will have the internet. Social media will not have internet. The small scale, you know, it affects like everything, airports, it's a decision that is made with a strong heart, actually. It affects even the people that actually work in that city. So basically, in as much as I'm not in support of internet shutdown in any way, because barely being home for less than an hour without internet is a punishment to me. I feel bad because my life is now online. So basically, when we talk of shutdown, we should look at it from all other sectors. Algeria had a shutdown based on the examinations the students were writing because the level at which more practice was taking place via the use of the internet forced the government to shut down the internet. Cameroon shut down the internet based on the political unrest. Each country has its own reason of shutting down the internet, but basically we should not all support shutdowns in any way possible. We should all actually engage governments at all levels Let's not take government as if it's the enemy of everyone. Let's find a way of engaging government in a way that, you know, you, you can't be antagonistic with government. When you're discussing something that is so serious, learn to compromise. We should learn to compromise. Yeah, we cannot like go on with all our shoulders high and expect to get results done. No. Government is not an individual. Government is an institution that covers everyone in that particular country. So basically, when issues of shutdowns are discussed, let us look at it from all angles, security, economy, and all other angles that will be affected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that contribution. We've got an itching participant on the other end who wants to respond. Good morning. My name is Titi. Um, two levels. There will always be a seemingly good reason for shutdowns. Second, Every law in place emerge out of a positive intent. It is the abuse of existing regulations and policies that leads to conversations like this. So in putting in place for telcos, as an example, a license that requires that they switch off on the request of government, there was a good reason behind it. Where the problem lies, though, is where there is a lack of transparency and accountability 
in the use of such laws and the powers that come with it. Um, without mentioning the particular telco, um, but more often than not, the process involves one communication, sometimes it's just a call, that indicates switch it off, and they have to obey, otherwise it becomes liable. That needs to be addressed. Yes, the concern around security is paramount, but it has become a blanket rule. And unfortunately, every single example that has been cited, um, based on the knowledge that I have, and I'm happy for anyone to disabuse my mind, there was no reason for there to have been a complete shutdown, and not my words, a complete shutdown. Fiona inferred it that there are ways and there are opportunities where we, we technology is sitting at a point where you can actually get to the point where you know where a threat is coming from. You can contain it. But we like blanket shutdowns. That's where the problem is. Second, is, or not second now, I've probably made like four points already. <laughs> um, fifth is um, recognizing that there will be need, the need for sometimes communication to be inter interrupted. It is important that if we indeed value fairness, openness, uh, and respect people's rights, that you go through due process to make that happen. More often than not, it's not happening. Due process is not happening, and that's why there will be calls that no, you cannot be transparent about it. Um, I'd also like to be able to speak to the fact that the consumer does not know the power that they carry. And that's, that's, a, that's something that we all, whether government, public, public sector, um, civil society, or the private sector, actually needs to work a lot more with. The government holds the license over, you know, the license power over telcos, but consumers <laughs> hold the money power sincerely. If your telco consistently shuts you out, excuse me, what are you doing? You know? Um, so there's also the ability to be able to educate consumers on their rights, but more importantly ensure that the consumer protections that we have in place in our countries are adequately known and actually are being implemented and respected. Unfortunately, in any of the African countries that I'm familiar with, it's laughable. Even in South Africa that we like to tout as, you know, sitting at the forefront of consumer um, engagement. It can take years and years, and there's an apathy when something is beginning to take too long. Lastly, a question, um, and here I will declare openly, I head a public policy for Google in Africa, um, particularly on these issues. It's the question that I'm consistently asking, where are the African private sector? Please, where are they? Where are they in this conversation? Where is the startup ecosystem that is leapfrogging and helping us breach the digital economic divide? Do they realize why engaging in public policy conversations matter? Plenty Pot is coming in 2018. The digital economy is high on the agenda. But where is our startup ecosystem? Are they in that conversation? Plus or minus, we have about nine to 10 months to be able to get them upskilled and interested to know whether or not they can continue to operate in an environment that continues to help them innovate. So sincerely, yes, point at government, but please also look at the private sector, particularly those that are in indigenous to the continent. That's something that I, as a public policy lead within Google, care about. But more importantly, civil society needs to realize that your allies are actually the folks that you're not necessarily looking at. I'm done. Wow. Um, very wow words there. Does anyone want to follow up from Titi's comments? I think I'll uh, take a shot at it. And I think Titi has basically just uh, hit the nail on the head without mincing any words. Because unfortunately, we go for a lot of these conversations. I happen to represent the technology service providers of Kenya that brings together a lot of the startups, the young entrepreneurs, the big guys, everybody. So when, when I speak in a lot of the meetings on their behalf, I speak for them. I share with them the conversations and where we are at. 
But I realized that there are not so many strong industry associations on this continent. When we try to count how many there are and try to have a conversation, I'm able to pick a handful of them, about six or so. And that limits the level of engagement of the startups, of the entrepreneurs, of the local developer, of the local ICT organizations that are indigenous to our respective countries. And it takes me back to a comment I said earlier. Some of us have been in this space for so long and we want to remain the only experts. We are not drawing in others to come in and build capacity. And that is why I asked, how many of you have brought in your government representatives to any of these meetings? Because it doesn't help us when you don't do that, it means you're not bringing new people, you're not bringing, you don't bring in any students, you don't bring in anybody, it's just about you. Hmm? As long as it is just about you, as an individual, regardless of which African country you come from, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Because attending this kind of fora is so important to our entire internet ecosystem. If we don't have new faces and create space for new entrants to come in and fit in. I was so happy when I met Yolanda in South Africa. She said, ah, I'm coming in for that. She said, good. Ah, go for it, go for it. She told me, I'm going to use your proposal. I was like, oh, okay, go for it. I didn't <laughs> think she was seriously going to, but, she's, but she's, we exchanged emails and she was working at it. And she had a lot of people who've been in the committee for long helping her. And I'm excited she was able to put this together. That is how we build capacity, by letting others also have an opportunity. If you have never let another person come in and have an opportunity and brought in someone else, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Can we agree? A recommendation, my recommendation is, can we agree after this IGF, all future internet-related meetings whether they are in Africa, whether they are out of Africa, we, that we are planning to attend, that we have schedules of, that you are aware of, we are going to share the information so that we ensure in our 54 African countries, we can have representation of government, civil society, academia, private sector, technical community. Then we can have more fruitful conversations. On the issue that uh, Michael, I was waiting for Michael to come back in, on the issue that he had mentioned of security, we do understand that security is important. And a lot of the times the internet is shut down in the interest of national security. But I have a case of Kenya where we had a lot of stealing of exams using technology. But instead of shutting down the internet during the exam period, we decided to change the process. We have all the students go through security checks, not entering the exam room with any electronic device. Mm -hmm. If they don't have the devices in the rooms, there's no way they're going to steal the exam. So they leave their devices out. And then we use the same technology that they were misusing was used to release the results, to check the results, and we had the most accurate results in, compared to previous years. In the last two years, we've had very accurate results reporting. And today, I think we also have results being announced right now in Kenya that were done without shutting down the internet, but making sure the internet became a tool for more efficiency. Exam leaking on, uh, uh, that had happened before could not happen because the technology was made so secure and the keys were of, for that technology were with the relevant people who are held totally accountable and responsible that they could not uh, be able to, to interfere with the exams. And the same goes for national security. Technical communities can help you get the culprits, but we need to talk. I do not know what security wants if security does not say, we need your help on this. We're not angels. We need to communicate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Fiona. So we have last eight minutes, so we'll take one more round of questions and then 
by the time the panelists respond, they will also include their closing remarks. Okay, questions? Yes. Uh, not a question. This okay. is Alain, uh, Alain Ayina Wakran. So, uh, from hearing Fiona, uh, I just want to, to add or to ask because I've been away for IGF for a while, but I know that we used to have um, national IGF, regional IGF, African IGF. So are we not able to get uh, all the, the parties together at the local level, the regional and the continental level before we come here? So what is the problem and how do we fix it? from what you are saying, because I expect that at the national IGF or regional IGF, we should be getting all the parties together to talk. But it looks like we are still missing something. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, it's Judith Hellerstein. Um, I very much like what Fiona was saying, and I think the idea of talking with others is also very important to make sure all the communities talk to each other, because without that, you're not going to have a solving. And also, TD had. Um, was excellent in our comments. My question is, you're talking about transparency. Um, is there processes where you can get, like you said, the security involved, like um, get the judicial system if something, if you have the regulator, if someone has to regulate to shut it down, do they have to go through a judicial process to make sure that it's a valid reason that is secure, that the technical community, that is something that the technical community could not do without that. Is there a process like that in place that you can show how openness and how transparent you are that, yes, we've tried all these means, the technical community wasn't able to do it, the other communities were not able to do it, we need this, we need this path, and then sign off on that, and that way, you can make sure that everyone is accountable. And I'm just wondering if that process exists or maybe how you can create that process. Are those the last questions or one more? Yeah. Um, we hear some very good thing, things uh, today. So I commend you for the panel for the comments. Um, let, I think two things I want to say. I've been a regulator myself in the previous decade. And at a certain point in time, I got a topic that the government had never really, at the national level, engaged in. And so nobody ever came to me, asked me questions or whatever. So what I did, I reached out myself. I went to the communities I needed to interact with. So in other words, when you're a regulator, what are your options to go out of your building and see what's really happening there? And then when I started to try to make policy, everybody showed up and contributed because they knew who, they, who I was and they wanted to be in the process. So I took the other, the other way around. And the, the, there's another one, and I forgot about it, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, I, if I remember it, I'll come back in a minute, but it's, it's also about reaching out and the, 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 the options that, yes, I, know, I remember, just by stalling a little. You were talking about how to engage at the national level. Uh, in our country, it's, it's arranged around the national IGF. And the, there's an organization, public-private platform, which is neutral, and that has been giving some money through different agents in, around the country, so government, industry, etc. And they actually engage and try to get youth in. They organize a youth IGF day. They try to bring youths to, to here through that funding that they get from several different parties. And they set the agenda for, for the national IGF, but also the topics we want to bring to to the, 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 the international IGF and the, and the, and the regional one. So that, I don't know if that's feasible in your country, but it's something to think about because a lot of the information can go through an organization like that and you get to know each other. And it means what I'm seeing, people never used to speak to each other because they were the enemy on the internet, are now totally respected because of their opinion and they at least understand each other's position. And from that point on, you can easily pick up the phone and discuss things together. And that is a process that took about 10 years. So just as a food for thought. Okay, thank you so much, um, everyone, for the comments. So I'll start from that side and just probably give you a comment if you have any and also closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Uh, just a follow up on Titi's uh, conversation. Uh, we, need, we need the ear of economic and trade ministers, investors, and development banks 
who can ensure that the internet is not shut because they they care about prosperity, they care about uh, um, the economic growth. Uh, we also need to uh, put the internet access as a human rights as a human rights issue. This, I think, will be a deterrent towards uh, governments that think about shutting down the internet uh, and maybe a thing of the past. Uh, we also need uh, translators who will be able to bring in the conversation with governments to show them uh, the economic implications of actually shutting down the internet. Um, um, on the issue of Helen, I mean, uh, we proposed a committee that will be of a, a stakeholder model which will bring in uh, the technical community and the government and maybe the civil society that before the internet is shut down, there should be, there should be this dialogue or a communication between them so that we see if is there, is there, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, a, a reason that, you know, can be given as the reason to actually shut the internet. So a committee that brings in the stakeholder uh, engagement between all these groups may be a way forward. But as I said, uh, this approach has, uh, is limited because at the national level, the power of the state is, 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 is final. So I don't know what will be the way forward. Mm. Um, just to note to the panelists, we literally have like an, a minute, so please keep it nice and brief and short. Thank you, Joash. Okay, so in most of the countries, the judicial process indeed exists. There is evidence which suggests that in some cases, the judicial process is not followed. In some instances, such as Rwanda, you can um, do interception or monitoring of communication, then you get a license uh, retrospectively. Um, the, the importance of the having laws has, has been mentioned. The importance of being uh, transparent how, about how these laws are implemented uh, needs to be emphasized because you would know whether there is indeed judicial oversight over the processes of shutdowns and censorship and interception of communications. When you look at transparency reports issued by the likes of Google and Facebook and Twitter, we did an analysis recently, African um, request these organizations for users' data or takedowns for the last three or four years. A huge majority of them failed because they were not, um, they didn't meet the standards. But we cannot know for national governments whether they owe the, there's any requests that are made for interceptions or takedowns that are not actually honored because they don't meet the threshold, because there is no judicial oversight and transparency in the processes within the continent. So my last word, I think we need to continue gathering evidence and talking about the effects of uh, shutdowns. If it happens in Kenya, let the people in Uganda talk about it. If it happens uh, in uh, Anglophone Cameroon, the people of uh, Frankfurt and Cameroon should also talk about it because the effects go beyond the immediate geographical area in which the shutdown is implemented because of the network nature of the digital economy. Finally, we also need to continue making the case that uh, the effects of a shutdown, however short-lived they may be, go beyond the few days over which the shutdown is uh, uh, effected. Uh, the only one point is that the national uh, legislation is not enough uh, to prevent internet shutdowns. So we have to go uh, uh, over that to adopting uh, regional and international uh, specific convention about human rights or not, uh, uh, on internet. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Lana. I'll just end up by saying that internet shutdowns, whether we like it or not, will happen. So for, for good or bad intentions, they will happen. So there, there comes the necessity and um, the necessity to establish a, a dialogue of trust, based on trust, transparency, and credibility between not only the government and civil society, but all multi-stakeholders. There also comes the, the necessity of including the youth because they have the capacity and um, engaging them in this process. I think they have the potential to 
start it must it must start somewhere so and uh, it will it will not la last forever so that's it thank you um so we at the uh, um internet society have been increasingly recognized that the the, the internet ecosystem is somewhat incestuous so we we like to speak to ourselves so in 2018 we're we're investing m our resources and our time in to reach in outside of our concentric circles we're we're investing more time into working with partners and working with um, groups that we have not worked with in the past so that we can we can act we can I increase our voice and increase our support to to add to address th these type of problems like internet shutdowns we're also increasingly working with a different group of 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 partners as, as well reaching out to underserved uh, groups and we're re investing some time into our youth development and capacity building because we see it as a very important counterweight to increasing awareness and building the new skills that we can a address the emerging uh, uh, threats. Uh, my closing remarks are that uh, I'll try and answer the questions as well. The, the national IGFs, the regional IGFs, the Africa IGFs are supposed to be opportunities where all these stakeholders engage, converge, and discuss. Unfortunately, it happens only in some of the African countries. We are not yet at a level where all countries are getting their governments into even the national IGFs. There are still challenges with government participants attending the national IGFs, and that means then the, the national conversation cannot happen. And that is why I'm tasking individuals. It has to be individuals willing to take time and just walk into the offices of your government representatives and have a conversation, a cup of tea, and, you know, cut a call, and let them know that you are willing to converse and to help. If we can address it that way, it helps us significantly. But because it doesn't happen, we find ourselves in situations like this, having this conversation here. And I think we can improve on that. The other thing is that uh, there's, there's questions on, on uh, process, and those laws are there. In Kenya, at least, the law is very clear, and, it, uh, and the regulations are very clear, and so there's a clear process of how private sector, technical community engaging uh, security agents happens and how we effect even an arrest and getting someone offline so that there, there's laws and that's very clear. On the third issue that uh, I think we have not discussed but is important to look at is the role of the UN sanctions on internet shutdowns. I think that the UN my personal view is that I think the UN can play a role, but it is very difficult for that to be achieved if there isn't a buy-in from the governments themselves to deal with each other when there, is, there are internet shutdowns. So that is a conversation maybe we'd need to take the next level of this, maybe Yolanda having a conversation along those lines and asking other governments to step in and deal with their fellow governments using UN sanctions and things like that to reduce the level of internet shutdowns because of the challenges in achieving the sustainable development mm. goals. And those are my closing remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you to all my panelists for joining us today. Um, and really, this is the first time we've organized a workshop, so it is a milestone, for, it's a milestone for us, and we hope to continue the conversation. Thank you once again. It's an interesting area. Yeah. It, will, it will continue being an interesting area. Okay. Do you see so a final solution? <laughs> Hitler is the only man who has ever had the final solution and it didn't work. <laughs>